welcome to another exciting part of our tipple along with me, um, by Keith Hayes, who is not in this program at the moment. Um, and this is Fergus. Hi there, Melissa. How are you doing? He knows loads about wine. I'm doing well. Thank you. Good, good. I know a little bit about wine, but we'll go from there. Yeah. <laughs> well, more than me because I know nothing. <laughs> but hopefully this session will be a bit of an education for you. Uh, and I brought two amazing wines to start off with as well. So one's from Portugal, from the Douro region, and the other one's from Chile as well. And both are fine examples of what these sort of overlooked regions uh, can, well, overlooked regions in the wine world and the wines that they produce uh, sort of need a little bit more shouting about, really. Um, so I'll happily start off with the Smiling Donkey here. It's got a funky little name, I really like it. Uh, but it's, it's famous, so the Douro region is famous initially for its uh, port, which is, an unfortif which is a fortified wine. Uh, and it has five main principal grape varieties that are grown in there. Uh, and then I actually produced, oh, blended in this grape as well, um, in this bottle. <laughs> so the, the port, the uh, wine that's used for the port is in... So the port well. is like, uh, it's a fortified wine that is in there and the grapes that are used in this bottle are also produced, or oh, also used okay. in port as well. And they go by a slightly different process, but the same principal grape varieties, which the Douro region is famous for, are used in this as well. Uh, it's also one of the, it is the oldest demarcated uh, regions in the world. And it's also one of the oldest wine regions in the world. So grapes have been going in Douro for over 2000 years. Oh wow. So it really benefits the region from, uh, a very warm and continental climate. Uh, it sort of sits just north, sort of the northeast region of Portugal, uh, and stretches along the Dura River, which sort of benefits from a, like warm uh, current breezes coming off the river, which help uh, regulate the temperatures throughout the growing season. But it's also sheltered by the Mauro Mountains as well on the west side, and then it kisses the border of Spain as well. But if, uh, like I was saying about the five main uh, grape, five main principal grape varieties, they are the Torrigo Nacional the Torrigo Franca, the Tinta Riolif, otherwise known as Tempranillo in Spain, which is famous in Rioja region. Uh, then you have the Tinta uh, Baraca and the Tinta Cal. So all of these are blended in there and they help produce, they each have the, add their own little element to the, to the wine and then help affect its style as well. So when you taste it, you're tasting a little bit of these little things will help its balance, help with the intensity, helps provide its deep rich uh, colour and it goes from there. It's beautiful. Should we have a try? Yeah, please. Smash in. Uh, so normally you can, with a corkscrew, you can take it off. Uh, what I recommend is to take it off just below this little lip there, because sometimes when bottles are st stored away, they collect dust. And so if you take it just above there, uh, when you go to pour it, the wine sort of catches on this little bit. It picks up a little bit of the dust. So what I always like to do is I just cut it underneath there. So when you do pour it into the wine glass, um, no dust is there and you're all happy. Everybody said, or you can simply, if you can do, just rip it off as well. <laughs> if you can do, sometimes they do it. This one's doing a little bit tricky, but there we go. And you're yeah. just left with that, which is nice. I don't um, think I'd be able to do that. <laughs> <laughs> So is this region also known for their donkeys? So, you'd be, well, you would have to say that it probably would do given the name of this. So this region is, the reason why uh, we have a smiling donkey on the front is because this donkey is the Mirror D's donkey. Uh, and this donkey used, was usually originally produced in the, well, not produced, but used in the agricultural land um, to help farmers when, it was, when there was no machines around. But ever since mechanization, these sort of donkeys have become sort of an old person's friend, really, at the end of the day, or sort of like an outdoor pet, if you will. Um, and they're now just sort of, they're, they're not really looked after, they're coming into extinction. So in 2003, uh, there was only about 800, 800 of these left in the region. And so the, uh, there was a real drive to get these donkeys sort of just staying in the world, really, in, in the sort of change of cl uh, climate change and all that sort of stuff. Uh, and so if you buy a bottle of these, some of the set, well, the proceeds, a proportion of the proceeds go towards supporting the Mary Bees donkeys so that they can live a happy and wonderful life, well, essentially. Makes so, yeah. me want to drink wine more. Good, yeah, exactly. You never th as much as wine, drinking wine is fabulous, you never thought you could do so good. <laughs> um, yeah. I especially pick these wine glasses as well for their sort of their shape. I mean, they're very attractive, elegant looking glasses. Um, 
but their shape as well. You see how they're sort of um, they're bending inwards as well. So they're sort of like in a bulb shape. They're very intense bulb shape, but they have a bulb shape nonetheless. When you swirl the rind, so how you try and pick up all the aromas that wine can produce, um, it helps collect all these all these aromas and smells. So that when you stick your nose in it and have a good sniff, you can smell all the lovely flavours that these have. So a good way of doing it, you can either give them on a flat surface, you can spin it around like that, or if you're a little bit more advanced, you can take it in hand and spin it like that. But hopefully, the wine should stay in there. That's how we go about it. We just Give it a little swirl. You can already smell, even if you put your nose quite clear, you can sort of smell the aromas anyway. It's quite pungent, quite very like pronounced flavours on there, which is lovely. Uh, and what you'd expect from the, the Smiling Donkey and the It's Fire Principal Grape varieties that I talked about, you expect like really dark um, fruit flavours that are coming. So you're looking for like black currants, black cherries, Ooh, um, cherry. and all that sort of stuff. Exactly. Cherry so yeah, it's very nice and pronounced, which I, I think this, again, this. This is why these sort of wines should be more considered in the world. Um, I say, yeah, we'll give it a little swirl and just do like a couple of like short, sharp sniffs. If you can, try and stick your nose in and you can get it away with it. And you can, if you can pick up anything else, I can sort of as well pick up a little bit of smoke and a little bit of wood in there if you can do. And so that shows that it's also been fermented in probably oak as well, which adds to that sort of flavor complexity and also helps um, uh, lower the level of tannins or reduce the harshness of tannins which we'll go into later um, as soon as we taste it which is exciting. Um, smell like corkscrew! <laughs> yeah, beautiful. Should we go ahead? Mm -hmm. Perfect. It's good. Do you like it? Oh it's not what I'm used to. Oh yeah. <laughs> I'm, Good thing. I'm, I'm a basic. I'm a basic girl. I just drink white wine. <laughs> okay, cool. Well, it's a new experience anyway. Yeah. But uh, what, so what I should have said before is, well, when you taste it, you want to try and a bit like we did with the nut when we were smelling it. You want to try and swirl it all the way around your mouth. Really, sort of get the flavours going all across your mouth, so it touches each other, bit, bit part of your mouth. Because the tongue is very important for tasting. Also, that general feel and also the body of the wine you'll get to feel if you put it all like, across your mouth as well. I sort of just brushed my teeth probably a few hours ago as well, so I'm sort of, <laughs> I can do them. The effects are sort of there, but not really. <laughs> but we'll go again. So yeah, really try and, some people like to call chewing the wine, but I'm, I'm a little skeptical of that one. So just try and imagine just swirling around in your mouth as much as you can for say a few seconds and then swallowing it and then we'll see you go from there. So you get that sort of, get that drying sensation, that little bit of... I, I think, yeah, now I, I feel like I smell cher cherry, but mm -hmm. I taste more like black currant. Okay, good. Is that... Yeah, that's perfectly all right. Yeah, a lot of the, even if they, they may not be, you may not pick it up as much in the nose, or in the palate, you can hop. It's usually the sort of same, similar sort of feel. So if you can pick up a, a, a more intense flavor on the, on the mouth and in the nose, then you're still in the right field. It's quite good. So is that just my nose and my mouth being different? No, they're just well, they're just picking up different things, or maybe your nose isn't that used to, or you can just clearly got a good mouth for black currant, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah, you could. I, what I definitely felt was just sort of a, a in my mouth, a, sort of a covering, or sort of a, like a dry covering around the mouth. I don't know whether you felt that. That's what the presence of tannins and tannins are, are, are in the grapes and the skins. Uh, they're along the script, the skins and the stem of the of the grape and then when they go about fermenting how they how red wine production is made basically they pick all the grapes off the vines they they, uh, they crush them so just to release the juices a little bit help with the whole alcoholic fermentation of the whole thing and red wine is a little bit different to white wine in that uh, the skins as well as a little bit of the stem goes into the the, the the sort of the fermentation of it to allow these sort of tannins to come through. And so this tannins are only uh, applicable to red wines, whereas you wouldn't really find them in white wines as well. You just oh. wouldn't find them because the skin isn't in con skins aren't in contact in white wine production mm -hmm. making oh, process. Okay. So you would never really, you would just never really get it there. Uh, so then after the, the alcoholic fermentation, where yeast is added just to get the, convert the sugars into alcohol, uh, it then goes through a draining process. It is then crushed a little bit further 
or pressed a little bit further anyway, uh, just to release a little bit more of those juices. Uh, and then all the, all the wine for the fermentation, for the pressing, uh, goes into a fermentation, goes into storage or maturation. So like the oak barrels, when I mentioned that you can smell like wood or a little bit of oak flavor. Uh, this is the sort of maturation period. And it varies depending on where the region is and what the sort of the winemaker wants to do or impart flavor onto the wine. And then it goes into bottling after that. Uh, so yeah, I think that's pretty good. Should we move on to the next one? Perfect, cool. So we'll pop that one to the side and then we'll compare them later on and see what sort of differences we can do. So this one, the Art of Wine, uh, it's a very pretty bottle, very pretty label. It's got the girl with the pearl earring, uh, which is a very, very, very famous painting by Johannes Vermeer. It's here, yeah, Chile. Uh, so Chilean wines are sort of, again, they, they, they lie, it's on the, in, it's in the South America, it lies on the west of the country, uh, and benefits also a little bit to the uh, to Portuguese wines in terms of their climate as well. So you have the, the Pacific winds coming in from the west, but you've also got the Andes, which separates Chile and Argentina. Yeah, it's a bit colder as well. It's it? a little bit colder, yeah. So, to, But it's also well, a little bit colder, I guess, towards the south of the region, but it, all, it can sort of vary as well. But, so the winds do help to bring that sort of cooling effect to the, to the, uh, to the grapes. But, it's also quite, as you work your way up north of the country, obviously it gets closer to the equator. A lot of the uh, wine producers tend to have their vineyards higher up on the mountains and benefit from having a cooler climate up there. Because sometimes, well, in regions where it is particularly hot, uh, the, wine, the grapes can get blistered essentially. A bit like if we spend too much time in the sun, these grapes sort of get blistered as well in some sort of way. And that really uh, imparts a quite a bad taste or, or imparts bad flavours into the grapes essentially. As I do. So it's a bit similar in that case as well. But Merlot uh, is a particularly very versatile grape as well. It's made, obviously made famous by uh, the Bordeaux, uh, being a part of a blend in that. And actually, just, but the French sort of made it popular in Chile as well. The Spanish brought it over, but the French popularised it in Chile uh, and really got it going in there. And so it's actually one of their most uh, mass, well, mass exported grapes as well because it grows so well in this. And this particular grape comes from the, the Central Valley. Which is uh, Chile's one of Chile's largest and probably most famous wine growing areas as well. It stretches pretty, a lot, a long way across the country, to be fair. But a lot of grapes really go well in this sort of warm, dry climate, similar to this, which is again great for growing grapes as well because of, it's a bit, a bit like any other plant, it requires photosynthesis. photosynthesis. Uh, so the sun, uh, uh, reacts with the water, helping produce glucose or sugar in this, and then that goes straight to the grapes, helping it sort of swell, and imparting all the lovely flavours that we get on here. Um, but yeah, I reckon we should have a try. Hold on, what is this malarkey about them tasting wine without me? Mm -mm -mm. I don't like that. So, unfortunately, I have to stop this programme right where it is. Because I was supposed to be the one to taste it. Just because I was late for a few minutes mm -mm, doesn't give them the right to do it without me. <laughs> so, the next wine, Girl with the Pearl Earrings. Watch out, you have to deal with me next time.